Oh boy, we've got a good one today. Episode 16 of Red versus Blue. My name is Mike Stark. And I'm Keith Curry, and here we go. Here we go is right. A lot to talk about today. We're going to try to get to it right away. But first, we got to talk about your appearance on PBS. You were on the commie station. Well, I occasionally watch PBS now. It's, you know, it's trying to get better. <laughs> Actually, uh, through unusual circumstances, uh, I was a designated spokesman for Steve Garvey. Even though my bit aired two hours before the polls closed, I take full credit for pulling him across the line. <laughs> and uh, Steve is now in a runoff with Adam Schiff, uh, finishing pretty closely, actually, with Schiff and the total vote in the primary. But he's, uh, he's off to the races, and it was fun to do. Yeah, it was great, and you did a great job. Well, thank you. We also got some press this week from Richard Wagner's radio column, which is in all the Southern California newspapers except the L.A. Times. It's in the O.C. Register, Press-Telegram, and all of those. And it shows up in the paper today, but it showed up online uh, earlier in the week. And he gave us a little uh, shout-out. And cast. kudos to you because of uh, you getting that in the paper. I'm getting people, I saw you in the paper. I want to, What's your podcast? Where can I find it? There you go. Well, you can find it if you haven't already. Well, you've obviously found it or you wouldn't be listening right now. But uh, tell your friends, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, we're on Spotify and iTunes and some other platforms. We keep getting platforms added every week. There's a new platform. Can't remember the name of it that just added us to their uh, podcast stuff. So you can get the podcast wherever you subscribe to a podcast. Okay, let's get into this. First of all, really quickly, Super Tuesday was kind of a dud. What are your thoughts on what happened there? It was the election everybody both dreaded and expected. There's a special place in heaven for the voters of Vermont, which was the state Nikki Haley carried. <laughs> Losing the other 15, uh, she uh, graciously pulled out of the race. And I was privileged to be on a Zoom call with Ambassador Haley. And she was gracious and I went to bed Tuesday night, a minority of a minority. I was a Haley voter in a minority Republican Party. But I woke up the most important, the most sought after, and the most determinative voter for how this election is going to come out in the country. And the president of the United States reached out to uh, Haley supporters with, a, with an invitation to, uh, to join. Uh, the other guy did call me a, uh, a radical left a Democrat. <laughs> but that, I thought that was very actually very, very gracious of uh, the president to do that. He, he didn't really make any policy concessions. But that was basically the story for Super Tuesday, which, you know, all the news channels covered it, but they didn't have a lot to say. There wasn't a lot to cover, really. There were two, two little nuggets of news there. Uh, number one, Biden loses American Samoa to a guy whose name I can't remember, 51 to 40 votes. Because, as they say in life, 90% of it is just showing up. And apparently he did a video call with some people in Samoa. And Biden didn't. So he Biden lost American Samoa. And 19% voted undecided in Minnesota. Right. So there are still serious warning signs for President Biden in these primaries that he keeps rolling up that he should be uh, cognizant of. Let's dive into the State of the Union address as I said, I approached the State of the Union address as a newly empowered, middle-of-the-road, moderate Haley voter and said, OK, here's your chance to woo me. He got up to the podium. He, he didn't even wait for the speaker to introduce him. He just started speaking. To his credit, he was off to a good start. He shamed the Republicans on Ukraine, which he should, because uh, there's a lot to be shamed about, uh, given the fact they're running out of bullets over there and these guys are dithering about it. So I thought, OK, that's a pretty good start. He's going to go get him. You could almost see Michael Johnson trying to hide under the desk while that was going on. <laughs> but then he took the wheels of the speech and he turned it to the ditch. And there he went for the either third or fourth consecutive State of the Union speech. Biden decided to use the pride and true. They just need to pay their fair share line in, in trying to whip up uh, taxes on uh, wealthier people. And, you know, he brought in the fact that he's going to get 400 bucks as a closing credit, I suppose, if you buy a new house or buy a bigger house, uh, which will barely pay your transfer taxes. Right. You know, he made a big deal about union jobs. The thing about it is 6% of the private sector workforce is unionized. Only 32% of the public sector workforce is unionized. So, you know, he's missing 94% or so of the workforce when he, when he does that. And it was sort of the whole laundry list of, you know, Bernie Sanders socialist stuff that he's been you know, spouting for a while now and, and has been fundamentally incapable of getting passed, which is, I think, a good thing. 
Okay, I'll give you a, a rough overview of, of how I felt about what I saw, and, and then we can talk about some specifics. I almost didn't watch it. I was afraid. I was scared. I was afraid that he wasn't up to the challenge. But as you mentioned, he started out strong, real strong. And then he got into the taxes and some of the other issues. I was kind of wondering when he was going to talk about the border. And the border didn't come up till later on. And we'll talk a little bit about that. My overall view of it was it wasn't a great speech, per se. It wasn't Ronald Reagan. It wasn't Barack Obama. Those guys were great orators. One of the Fox commentators referred to him as he was acting like the character in Gran Torino. And you know what? Actually, it kind of came off that way because he was angry and he was mad and there were reasons to be mad. The thing that impressed me the most and the thing I was afraid he couldn't handle was how he engaged criticism in real time. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're right. Now, again, it was a stacked deck because he's up against Marjorie Taylor Greene. So if you can't beat her, you shouldn't be in politics. I'll just say that right right from the start. And so he was dealing with, you know, people who were sitting down below him who have a reputation for being, you know, kind of goofballs. And he played them like a fiddle and allowed them to be goofy and made them look goofy. And he he did a pretty good job at that. He got the the woman's name wrong, who uh, was the uh, victim of the of the alien, and right. he called the alien illegal. So now the left is all jumping all down on him because he's not politically right. correct. Right. But you know he did handle that pretty well. Let's talk about the border because uh, that's where him and the Republicans there was some back and forth going on beyond Marjorie Taylor Greene, and my take was is that. He's saying that everybody's to blame for this. He's not specifically pointing at himself, but he certainly was pointing at the Republicans for not passing their bill, basically. It was really telling when they went to the audience and they had a close-up of the uh, senator that was part of putting that package together, and he says, that's true. You could read his lips, said, that's true. That really was probably one of the most stunning things in the whole speech, I thought, because it was an acknowledgement that, you know, that bill needs to be passed. That is the number one issue in America now. And it was surprising that it was so towards the back of the speech. Right. But that's what he did with it. The key thing is, I think he did a good job of coming back after a strong start and then, you know, sort of getting saggy in the middle. He had a strong pitch on immigration. And he did hold the Republicans' feet to the fire for not passing the bill. And so the Republicans, what they should have done if they'd been smart, is, okay, I'll see you and raise you and you know, pass the bill, add some amendments, right. pass, bring up a new bill. Sure. And they fell into a trap and didn't do any of that. And he sounded like a very strong argument on the part of Biden until the commentary afterwards when they played the clip of Mayorkas from 2021, basically saying these are all of the Trump border initiatives that we have repealed to make it easier for people to come and easier for people to get into the country, and easier right. to process their applications for uh, asylum, which really undercut everything that he was trying to do. And you're right, he was trying to say there's a little bit of blame for everybody, which means don't blame me completely because, right. you know, it's it's everybody's to blame here. Sure. But anyway, overall, I thought he did a fairly good job. I think that the speech was definitely not aimed at anyone other than Democrats. The ones he'd lost because of the concerns about age and about all of that, I think that he may have won some of those back, right? Well, he better hope he did because there was nothing in it for independents or Nikki Haley voters right. or people in the middle or moderates or disaffected Republicans. And you were wearing and your T-shirt, right? I had my band permanently T-shirt, exactly. <laughs> I was ready to go. But here's the thing. I don't think he did that because the speechwriters didn't have a touch on the country. I don't think they were misread the audience. I don't think they were not cognizant of the fact that there was opportunity to pick up middle voters. I think they had very uh, definitive analytics and polls in front of them that told them that Joe Biden has very deep and serious problems with his base. Mm -hmm. And they invested in going after the base. Uh, Bernie Sanders could have given the speech. So that speech essentially kicks off the 
campaign, right? Would you say? I think we are off and running. Off and running, which is going to be fun for Keith and I. Trust me, this is going to be a great, a great time over the next few months. A great and trying time for the nation, probably. But we'll have fun with it. Now, uh, before we leave the State of the Union address, we need to talk about the rebuttal, which happens after everyone. I don't know why anyone would want to do the rebuttal on either side for any president, because it it's a lose-lose. You never win as a, the person that does the rebuttal, right? There's no record of anybody winning yet. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so let's begin with, with uh, Katie Britsby. Uh, let me ask you, Mike, what did you think of it? I thought that they'd put some AI to work here. <laughs> She lost me real early in it because it was like a Stepford wife speaking. Uh, Those terms, AI and Stepford wife, have been used repeatedly in social media. And I did sort of a little survey today of of news articles, satire, social media, Facebook, all of that about the speech. And particularly my male friends uh, are all pretty critical of it. Women, less so. A lot of people, by the way, commented on our cabinets and our tile work, which apparently is pretty expensive and very uh, custom. <laughs> I'm sitting there watching it with my wife, and I've never actually seen this woman before in my life. Mm. And I'm going, okay, now the delivery has got some issues with it in terms of breathiness and the you know, almost tears, et cetera. But, like, where has she been in the Republican Party? Oh. You know, and my wife is sitting there, and she's, like, you know, cheering her on. And I'm going, you know what? I finally see a strategy that... Trump could win this election. They need to build a basement in Mar-a-Lago and put him in there. And they need to take this woman and have her go work the school carpool lanes in about 20 counties up and down with the moms. And I think actually Republican and suburban mothers and women uh, responded to her. I think she was authentic. And a little bit of trivia. She was 42 years old uh, doing this response to the oldest president in American history. Uh, That record previously went to the 40-year-old Joe Biden who did it to Ronald Reagan <laughs> in 1983 or something. Now, that's great so, trivia that you don't get anywhere else. That's <laughs> awesome, Keith. <laughs> the speech needed a lot of work, and the speech delivery needed a lot of improvement. But I think she's a, a rising star, and she is a, uh, on the short list for vice president. People like Roger Stone and, and Charlie Kirk and some of the other uh, Magosphere uh, bloggers think she sort of blew her chance last night. But I'm not so sure. I think she makes a pretty good balance to that ticket. And certainly is is sort of different from Trump. It was a little dystopian. It should have had more Reagan optimism in it. But I think she can speak to, uh, you know, the the middle house fives and the moderates if given the right material. Yeah, she just needs a little work, a little seasoning, right? A little seasoning. That's exactly right. All right. Now let's talk about a couple uh, other things. Your buddy, your party mate, uh, George Santos, was at the uh, festivities yesterday. What, What are your thoughts on that? I just hope he's never my cellmate. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing. Apparently, if you are a, a past member of Congress, uh, you can come to the speech for the rest of your life. So really? he, has no, he has nothing else to do. So he shows up. Most have the good grace uh, to stay home and not do that. But he was there. You know who else is there? Anthony Kennedy. Apparently, if you're a former Supreme Court justice, you've got a reserve seat anytime you want. It. And he was there. So it was alumni day at the, at the State of the Union. And there you go. Anything else we need to cover? I think we uh, we covered last night fairly well. Anything else? Well, I think we now know what the parameters of this election are going to look like and what's going to make the difference. Turnout is, uh, is a key issue, and it's been low across the board. We've talked earlier about how it's been half of what it was in the 2020 Democratic primaries. Turnout in California right now stands at just under 21 percent. So that'll be perhaps an all time record low. Fred Luntz the other day said he thinks it's going to be a high turnout election because everybody is going to be so persuaded. And and this is where uh, Katie Britt was sort of signed to sit the table. So persuaded that the other side is going to lead to the apocalypse that they're going to come out to vote against the other guy. Right. And it's going to be a tremendously negative election. Typically, though, that drives turnout down. Mm. So we're going to see because that's the only card either side has to play is to beat the hell out of the other side and make them utterly unacceptable. That's what's going to happen. The third, fourth, and fifth party candidates are going to play a critical role in these states. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., we talked last time, made it ballot in Arizona and Georgia. He now made it in uh, 
Nevada. So uh, he's going to be a bigger instance. There was, that's the reason why Maria Shriver was sitting up there next to mm-hmm. uh, the first lady last night. You know, strap in, you know, Biden's health could be an issue at any point in time. International affairs could take a weird turn at any point in time. Sure. Donald Trump is going to spend an entire year going to court. We really don't know how that's going to play out, but it can't possibly be good. He, by the way, posted a $90 billion uh, bond today Yeah, uh, for Eugene Carroll. So strap in. It's going to be an election for the ages. Subscribe to the podcast, Red versus Blue, and like our Facebook page. And we'll see you again next week for yet another edition of Red versus Blue. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>